Well, I'm excited about this one because we start DCC wiring this big layout. G'day guys and welcome back to Layla Central. My name's Clinton, I'm your average model and in this video we're talking about DCC wiring and specifically for this layer. Now for those that have just joined us, uh, such as my new subscribers, welcome to the actual uh, channel guys. Um, you know, follow along, leave your comments down below. Um, I do read them all and I do reply to them all as well. Um, and if you're of course watching this for the very first time, don't forget to hit that like, uh, subscribe button, hit that bell notification so you can follow my progress on this very large double deck layout that I'm actually building. Now I had a couple of requests from some of my uh, subscribers in my last video where I talked about the bench work and uh, putting this all in. Now one of the requests that some of my subscribers gave is they wanted some information about the wiring aspect, uh, whether it was A, they wanted to learn about it or they wanted to show a bit of interest really and how I go about wiring such a thing. So this is what this video is all about. Now. Bear in mind, I am not an electrical engineer. I don't have, I'm not an electrician or anything like that at all. Um, I do have a fair bit of knowledge on electronics, which I'm just gonna pass on to you guys. But having said that though, I'm not telling you how to wire your layouts out. I'm not, uh, you know, I don't bear any legal responsibility if you use wiring, etc. cetera, uh, you know, and you've adopted some of my practices, etc. cetera. You know, you do it at your own risk. Um, I mean, I'm very careful with uh, power as well, but um, at the end of the day though, you're responsible for your own wiring and your own choices, okay? So that part out of the way, let's get on to the fun stuff. Now, in order to actually put in DCC wiring, uh, or wiring in general, into this train layer, which you can see we've got multiple levels here going on, the thing that we need to do is start putting in a bit of a plan. Uh, because otherwise, how do we put in wiring if we don't know what our goal is? So, let's grab out my whiteboard. Now, for those that followed the channel for a long time, you've seen this whiteboard before. Um, it's uh, a little bit changed, but yeah, you know, it's a great way of illustrating to you guys what's actually going on. So, let's bring it out. Okay, so here it is, and a great way to show, obviously talk and show you guys about things. So, obviously we need to think about what are our needs, what are our plans when it comes to actual wiring itself. Now, I've put down here a few items that I want or, you know, long-term need in the actual layout itself. So, basically, the first thing first is the actual DCC bus. Um, now, that is the main uh, two wires that go from the actual main uh, DCC unit, if you want to call it that, and you know it distributes the power around the actual layout. So that's the main track bus, if you want to call it that. The other thing is also I want to incorporate an accessory bus. So very similar to the DCC bus, I'm going to have two wires, but they're going to be separated from the DCC unit, and their purpose is for accessories that require power, such as turnout motors, signals, and even uh, lighting on the actual scenery itself. So if I've got stations with lights around, I want those in the actual, uh, to be running off this accessory bus. The next uh, bus that we need is an, a cab bus. And that's essentially, as I go around the layout, I'm gonna have these little ports around, uh, distributed around, so then I can plug in and control my actual uh, trains and systems. So that'll be a separate line. And of course, the other important thing is layout lighting. Eventually in between the decks, I wanna have some overhead lighting. So we need to you know, talk and possibly uh, think about that as well. Now, the purposes of this video, uh, we're going to be talking about the DCC bus, the accessory bus, and the cab bus itself. So we'll get started on the DCC bus and um, yeah, we'll go from there. Now, what I'll be talking about is some fundamentals on electronics and wiring and kind of explaining why I've done things the way I have as well. Um, now, you may not agree with some of the things that I'm choosing and that's perfectly fine. There are many ways how you can wire a layout. And the other thing is also no layout is wired the same as someone else because of many factors, you know, such as the DCC unit using, if it's analog or digital, um, also, you know, how much power you got running, how many locos you're running, and indeed the skill of the person installing the electrical wiring as well. So that's another reason why you just got to be careful what you do. Do your research, of course, and, you know, there's a lot of great resources out there, whether they're online, books, but also club members as well if you're out there. Um, so let's talk about the DCC bus. Um, and start with that. Okay, so first thing we're going to talk about is the DCC bus. Now there's a couple of terms or items I want to discuss with you guys so then you know what I'm talking about and also where I'm going with it. So 
With the DCC bus itself, there's a few things that we need to consider, such as a booster district. Now, some of these terms or some of these items you may not be dealing with if you've got a small layout. This is quite a large layout um, by my like home terms. It is a small layout if you think of a club layer. Now, some of these terms might be used in clubs. If you've got a normal, a basic, simple little layout, such as six by four feet, some of these things you may not need to worry about, but we'll still talk about the concepts, so then you get an idea on what I'm doing here. So, one of them is the booster district. Now, depending on the size of your layout, you may have multiple boosters actually running your layer. In my case, this is my booster. It's an NCE Smart Booster. Um, upgrades my whole, um, running lines to five amps so I can run multiple trains, sounds, all sorts of stuff. Now, if you've got multiple boosters, you'd create booster districts. Now, for example, because I've got two levels on my actual layout, I could have a booster up above and one below to power each section. Each one of those levels would then be a booster district. And it's the error powered by the actual booster. Now, with my layout, I've got two levels. I'm going to run one at a time. I'm not running them both at the same time. This should be capable of handling it. But what I plan to do is, because I've got a series of connections uh, on here, I'm going to have only one district, if you want to call it that, or one level running at once. So my booster district is the level that's running at the same time. Now, I'm working on the middle level. So the middle level is the district uh, to be working on, essentially. So. I'm not really going to have booster districts per se because I'm only having the one unit and it's only powering one level at the same time. One item that has come up is power districts. Now, power districts is a bit of a topic. Every people, uh, many people have got different opinions on what a power district should be, uh, how often it, you need to have it and so on and so forth. Now, what is a power district itself? Well, as I've written here, it's a short circuit protection in a set area itself. Now, why would you want something like that? Well, for example, on big club layouts, if someone's over the other side, fair distance away doing some shunting and a short circuit appears, you don't want the whole layout to shut down completely. You want it isolated just in that one area so that operator you know, can address it, but it isn't, doesn't interrupt other people doing that. Now, with my layout itself, I've got a station essentially on the east and the west side of the actual layout. Um, I'm not gonna have multiple people running trains in here. It's just gonna be me. And if a short circuit occurs, I'm just gonna fix it right then and there. And it's not gonna disturb anyone else really, essentially. So a power district, I wouldn't actually, I'm not going to put in here because the benefits don't really give me much benefit. If I was having multiple running sessions in here where I've got someone shunting us or dispatching trains and stuff like that, then yes, something like that would be quite beneficial. Um, However, um, there's other things that I'll be looking into, but a true power district, like I'm not gonna separate this into blocks, I can do that, but why, if it's just gonna short and isolate that one area where I'm still am, it's not gonna make any difference to me, so I'm not inconveniencing anyone else. Having said that though, you could think of the entire level that is running at the same at the time. So think of the middle level and the and the bottom level, two separate complete levels. Each one of those is its own power district, if you want to call it that. Now, having said that though, I will be putting in some power protection in here, which we'll talk about shortly, um, because we do need short circuit protection as well. Most, uh, if not all DCC units themselves have some form of short circuit protection built in them. So if a short occurs, this takes it and you know keeps resetting it until the short circuit is clear. However, these are not made for that role. And I want something that's more durable that can handle the short, because if a short's left too long, you can cause some serious damage to these things. And you know your boosters are not exactly cheap. Um, so in my opinion, you should have some form of protection on there to make that investment last as long as possible. So we will be putting in some short circuit protection, but not power districts uh, per se. And of course, we've got the track bus, which everyone's heard of. And if you've got power districts, they all connect essentially to this bus, which distributes the power and your commands around the whole layout itself. So they're the uh, main concepts. So what am I doing? Am I having booster districts? Not really, I've only got the one booster. It's gonna power on one level at the one time, even though it's capable of doing them both. I mean, I'm not that multi-skilled, unfortunately. Power districts, not putting in power districts, but I will be having short circuit protection. And of course, there's the track bus, which you've gotta have that, of course. So what I'll talk about is some short circuit protection and what I'm gonna do about that. 
Okay, so on to the next part of short circuit protection. And what am I going to actually do there? Well, short circuit protection. Now, here's a basic diagram on what a layer can hook up. You've got your track, you know, your rails, you've got a wire running from that to your booster or your DCC system. Now, if you have a short, it runs directly to your booster and, you know, it kills it, it keeps resetting until the short is actually clear. However, these are not made for that purpose. Um, they've got the feature in there, but I want something dedicated for that. Now, some people use uh, short circuit protection, such as light globes, uh, to give them a good signal when it occurs, to all various uh, other things. Now, what I'm actually using is an electronic circuit breaker. Now, I run an NCE system, and I've got myself an EB1 circuit breaker, which you can actually see here. Now, this is a very small uh, and simple setup. Got some customization features, which when it comes to installing, I will run through as well. Um, but otherwise, it is very straightforward. Now, how that actually works is, so for instance, that was our basic diagram. We make a cut in our wire and we put in the EB1 or our circuit, short circuit protector right in here. So what occurs is if the short occurs on the actual line itself, it goes to our electronic circuit breaker and it trips in here and it will take, keep essentially resetting it until it's the short is actually clear. This can take a heck of a lot more uh, punishment, if you want to call it that, than what the booster will. And this will fail before the booster. When there's a short occurring, it's isolating it and stopping it right here. The boost is still working, it's still sending power across, but it's interrupted because this is actually providing that protection. So a simple way of protecting your most expensive investment, the actual booster. Now, a short circuit uh, protection or circuit breaker doesn't protect your DCC chips. If there's a short and that chip burns out, the chip burns out. This is only to protect the booster itself. So this uh, this little circuit board I'll install in and uh, you know it's gonna work quite well. And I'll have one on each level. So when I connect to the bottom level, that will actually uh, be installed as well. So just a quick uh, item on short circuit protection there. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna be talking about is the wiring types. Now there are many ways in how you can wire up a layout. Um, and indeed, especially this one, given the options that I do have. now. I'm, there's many different methods. I'm just going to talk about two different methods here um, that some people may have seen or heard of before, um, and those are distributed wiring and also star wiring itself. Now, as you can see here, I've just drawn a couple of diagrams. Now, you know, they are quite crude, but the idea is just to illustrate the difference between them. So we'll talk about the distributed wiring part. So we start off with our booster to begin with, and your bus goes into the um, circuit breaker, or CB as I've called it there, rather than writing it all out and your bus then goes right across and this feeders or everything taps into it. Now, these may not necessarily be drop feeders to the rails, they could be your districts. So you could have a district coming off here where then your feeders all go into that, into that particular area and so on and so forth. So very simple diagram where you've just got one line, main line and everything just taps into it itself. The other option is a star wiring uh, method where same as before, we got the booster that goes to our circuit breaker, and then it then feeds directly off that. So it all comes to one central point itself. Now, each one of these has their own benefits and, uh, and disadvantages as well. For example, a star wiring uh, area. If each one of these was a district, for example, going into here and it failed, you can isolate it to that particular area there. If these were track feeders, so each one of these was a track feeder, you know, if that area failed, you know it's exactly in this area here. Whereas when it comes to this part, because everything's tapping in here, sometimes it can be difficult to trace back. The other benefit is this requires less wiring. This requires an awful lot more wiring. Um, so, you know, there are many methods out there. There are more benefits as well to both as well as disadvantages. Um, but which one am I going with? Well, I'm going with the distributed wiring part for the following reasons. One, it's easier to put in, you know, I've got my booster, a line going to my circuit breaker, and then I run two wires, you know, your positive and negative around the layout and the track feeders will just drop right into it and connect. Um, so easy to set up, it's easy, uh, cheaper as well because I'm using far less wiring as well. Um, and given how extensive my track work is, which to be honest, really isn't that crazy, 
uh, this will work perfectly fine for me. If I had a much more complex track uh, installation to put in, then I might actually consider the star wiring di uh, method. But for what I'm actually doing, the, uh, the distributed wiring part is what I'm going to be doing. Um, so as mentioned, you know, I'm gonna have my booster connected to the circuit breaker and then two lines coming off that going around the layer and I'll tap into it with my actual track uh, as required. Now, as uh, I've now covered those items, the thing we're gonna start talking about is electrical wiring itself. Now, um, brace yourself. I'm not gonna try and bore you here, but there's some things I wanna talk about to illustrate why I've selected the wiring that I have. Um, and you may learn something from it. Um, if you're not interested in a bit of theory and uh, you know the, the physics, if you wanna call it that, behind it, my advice is skip, skip a bit. Um, but if you're interested in learning about wiring and you know what exactly it is, how to work out what's suitable and so forth, um, stay tuned and we'll cover that right now. Okay, so we're gonna talk about wiring now. Um, and obviously what our goals are when it comes to actual wiring. Now, one of the things that we need to take a look at is what is our actual goal? now? performance is the ultimate goal full stop where you know if your wiring's not adequate you can get loco uh, variable speeds in your loco as it runs around the layout now for small layouts you know some of these items here you won't encounter it's only when you start building large layouts that some of these items or problems can start to appear which we need to consider so for example a loco speed varies as it runs around so as it runs around it might get slower it might get faster now you think, but it's DCC, it should run at the one level. And essentially, yes, but it also is based on what power is available. And in short, why has a resistance? We might put in 12 volts or 240 volts at the end of a wire, and depending on its length, it will have degraded. There will be some power loss because of the resistance in that wire itself. Now, the longer the wire run, the greater the resistance actually is and the more uh, volts or power you lose as well. And that's where you get your power loss, or in this case, loco speed variables. Now, um, think of it is as like DC, uh, when you turn your dial, you're increasing and adjusting, you know, your power volts going through. This is the same concept, except the length of your wire or your resistance, resistance is creating that issue. So you may have an issue on that. Inconsistency. You know, the last thing you want is to have a train stop and slow, you know, go faster and slower, faster and slower as well. And that can be contributed to a raft of things, not just resistance, but we're also talking interference, all manner of things. The other thing is also lighting differences across the layout. If I've got overhead lights going on, for example, you know, I don't want some areas brighter than others because of poor wiring. Same with the actual uh, lighting in the scenery aspect. If we're talking station lighting, I don't want some globes to be running brighter than others. Subtle differences I'll accept because, you know, the real world, some globes were newer than others. Some of them, you know, had uh, deterioration in the glass, may not have been as clear. So there will be some subtle differences, which I'll accept, but I don't want big noticeable differences where I go, you know, that's a problem right there. The other thing we need to consider is the wire itself. Now, as power runs through it, and depending on what you're doing with it, it can generate heat and in some cases get very hot. And the last thing we want is for this to turn into a massive oven because, you know, it's in a steel shed. There's a lot of timber, combustible items, um, you know, so we need to be very careful about that. And one of the things that I do exercise is I've got a fire extinguisher handy. So if something were to occur in here, while I'm in here, I can put it out quickly, but the layout is never on if I'm not in here at the same time. And of course, short circuit damage. Now, even though I'll have a circuit breaker installed here, some cir uh, short circuits may occur and of course do some damage, such as to the wiring itself. Um, it could be generating that heat. So there's a lot of things to consider, um, but the ultimate goal with any wiring, especially with a large layer, is performance. We want good, reliable performance. Now, how do we get something like that? Well, let's go to that, shall we? Okay. So the First thing we're going to talk about here is you know, the reliability of the train, such as variable speeds. Now, as I mentioned before, and voltage drops, um, you know, when you start dealing with a large layer and a lot of wiring, that can present a problem. Now, what I'm going to do is just explain to you what it really is without trying to confuse you here, of course. But for example, a voltage drop. So what that means is we've got, say, a certain power input at one end, by the time it travels to the other end, it will have lost you know, a bit of legs. It would have reduced in power. So that is the, the difference between the exit and the input is what you call your voltage drop, where it's been lost. So 
For example, some wiring, um, you know, manufacturers will tell you what potentially the voltage drop is. Where in my case, I've had to calculate it out. Now, I'm not going to go into the maths of that to bore you guys with it. Um, you know, there are methods out there on how you can work that out if you wish to look into it. So, as an example, I've just used 2.4 volts as a voltage drop over a selected distance. Now, if you think about your uh, power that you're putting in here, well, okay, 2.4 volts. You don't just go 2.4 volts minus, you know, uh, your 120 volts minus 2.4 volts. It doesn't work like that because the 2.4 volts is a rating over a particular distance as well. So the longer the distance is, the greater the voltage drop can be. Um, so very, you know, we can talk about voltage drops and wiring in general for days and days and days. Um, but I'm going to simplify this as best as possible. So for example, if we've been put at 120 volts at one end of our actual uh, DCC bus, and we know the voltage drop is 2.4 volts across that, if we divide that by the power we're putting in, we've got a reduction of roughly 2%, which isn't too bad um, for that. However, if we've got a low voltage coming in, for example, 12 volts, by the time we you know, do our voltage drop divided by what we're putting in here, we actually get a reduction of 20%. Now, that sounds quite large, but how does that translate to a train that's actually running? Well, for example, if we've got a train running at 100 miles uh, per hour, and that could be model speed, if we reduce 2% of that, its actual speed is 98 miles per hour. Whereas, if we've got only um, a voltage drop of 20%, because we're using a 12 volts, the difference in speed, while we're trying to put it at 100 miles per hour, it's actually 80 miles per hour. And this is where, on a large layer, it can play a big factor. Because while the train goes around, the voltage drop is getting bit greater and greater. And as a result, we've got a train that's varying its speed uh, because of its power availability. Um, and this does apply to DC, uh, so to DC in uh, concept as well. So as the train goes around a long distance as you get to a certain part, you may increase the dial to give it more juice so it keeps running consistently. But who wants to be sitting at a dial constantly going up and down, up and down, varying the voltage just so it runs at a constant speed. Now, as a general information, there is no wire that can produce 0% resistance. There is always resistance and as a result there is always some form of voltage drop. Now, depending on what wire you select, etc., it will determine uh, sorry, working out your voltage drops and everything else will determine what sort of wiring you actually need as well as, um, you know, the booster as well. So it can get quite complex, particularly if you're dealing with a large layer. Um, however, it is doable though, of course. Um, and of course, we'll talk a bit about the actual wiring itself. Um, so how does this play with me? What am I actually going to do? Well, I've got some wiring that's pretty expensive, hence why it's taken so long for me to get this uh, video done and out. I've actually had to get this wiring in um, that I wanted to actually use, which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Okay, so the next thing we're going to be talking about is then the actual standard wire resistance values. Now, this is a very useful thing um, to actually use when it comes to selecting your wiring, which played a big part into selecting what sort of wiring I wanted on here. Now, what we've got here is the uh, the actual gauge of the wire itself. So we've got 18 AWG, 16, 14, or 12 AWG. Now, what that stands for is the American wiring gauge. Um, and that's essentially a unit of measure of the wire, which we'll talk about a little bit later on on what exactly that is. Now, as a you know standard uh, value, if you think of six, uh, 18, uh, the size of the wire of 18 AWG, You've got roughly about 0 0.006 uh, ohms of resistance per foot of wire. So ohms is a measure of resistance um, and it's a, a value to determine, okay, how much is my voltage drop going to occur? So if we were using 18 AWG uh, wiring and if it was essentially, you know, 0 0.0061 resistance of ohms uh, per foot, if I had a 100 foot length of wire, I would have 0.61 uh, resistance actually occurring. Um, and of course, the difference in the wire, if we start stepping up in gauge, so 12 gauge wire, for example, gives us uh, less resistance per foot, as we can see here. So the difference between 18 gauge and 12 gauge wiring is quite significant, as you can see here. 0.61 is a difference of 0.16. Now, there are various factors that can influence this as well. For example, the diameter of your wire itself. 
um, the quality of the product you're using as well. And there's different wires. We've got multi-strand wires, we've got single core wiring. You know, there's a lot of factors in here that come into play as well. And I'm not gonna confuse and get into all that sort of stuff. I will explain what I've chosen um, just to show you guys. And of course, the other thing is the length of wire used. As we can see here, the longer the length, the more resistance we're getting overall. Um, and that plays a big part if you've got a large layout like myself or indeed a club layout as well. As a result of this, the one thing to keep in mind is my actual booster itself. It puts out a certain amount of amps, which is five amps along with you know a select amount of volts. So for me to work out what sort of gauge wire I actually needed, I needed to work out my length and distances along with voltage drops to then select what was the acceptable form of wiring that I could use to then get good reliable performance out of them. Okay, one thing to be wary of as well when dealing with large lengths of bus wire is it can affect your short circuit protection. Now, that might sound a bit interesting and it, it, to be honest, it really is. As we've discussed before, we've got resistance along the wire itself. So if I put a power at one end, what's the voltage at the other end? And there will be a difference and it will get lower. The same will happen if you've got a short circuit, which as we know, if a short occurs on the layer, it travels back to what could be your booster or your DCC system to handle. So the thing is, I've got a electronic circuit breaker that I'll be connecting to this. Now, how a bus length can impact that is the circuit breaker will kick in and isolate it if it detects a short over a certain value or an amount. Now, if I've got a long bus length and a short occurs, as we know, it's a large circuit, so it goes along one, uh, so the positive travels through the motor of, say, the locomotive, back along the negative rail, back to here. Now, if there's a short, it's going to come back to here. Now, on its return back, when it gets to the actual circuit breaker, there's still that resistance playing in part. Now, it may drop the voltage to the point where the circuit breaker doesn't kick in because it can't detect it. It might be X amount of amps over the other side of the layer and it's you know, really creating some heat, etc. But the short hasn't, the power hasn't been isolated from the booster or even that uh, or my uh, circuit breaker because the voltage drop has altered it in such a way as it's traveled back, it's dipped it below its tripping point. So how do you fix that? Well, again, you've just got to do your maths. You've got to look at your, you know, your theories and all that sort of stuff and try and work out what's the best wiring. So always bear in mind that, you know, your wiring can play a part in how your circuit breaker actually works as well. So keep that in mind. Okay, one of the things uh, we're gonna talk about is interference. Uh, and now on a small layout, interference may not be something you'd need to consider, but on a large layout such as mine with the amount of wiring that I've got going on as well as the length, it can play an actual role and it's something that I need to be mindful of and it will change how I go about wiring this up. So for example, for those that don't know, an electrical wire, as soon as power runs through it, a magnetic field is actually passed. Now, excuse the terrible drawings here, but the idea is just to illustrate how they're produced. So if we've got wiring, go, the current goes in a particular direction, which is this red text here. You've got a magnetic field that goes in a particular direction. Now, this is across the whole length of the wire. Now, if we've got current going in the opposite direction, that essentially that magnetic field travels in a completely opposite direction. Now, think of these as my two bus actual wires. If the power, you know, and there's other factors that influence this, this sort of magnetic field going across here, just on the DCC wire itself, may or may not cause any interference issues, but bear in mind, I've got accessory wiring, I've got cab bus wiring to consider, as well as overhead lighting. So all these magnetic fields running in different directions, along with different signals getting put through and so on and so forth, can create some undesirable effects, such as electromagnetic interference that we may actually get. And that's what this concept actually is. These magnetic fields are interfering, causing an electromagnetic interference uh, issue. The other thing is also I may get interference in the actual cab itself, the dirt signals not going through to the, uh, the locomotives themselves properly. Voltage spikes. Now this may be of an interesting one uh, because also if there's a voltage uh, spike as well, that will produce and adjust the magnetic field creating also undesirables in some cases. We can get crosstalk where, for example, if I've got cab information trying to get sent across the, the cab wires to the actual uh, DCC system, some of it may be lost and cross over into actual wires as well, which sounds bizarre, but it does occur. 
magnetic fields, undesirable things such as, you know, we've all got a magnet occurring underneath the actual track itself and the train, you know, I might have some in, um, some uh, usability uh, adjustments that are occurring just because there's a magnetic field under there. And the other thing is noise as well. So when I'm running a train around, for example, as we, uh, you know, increase and decrease the power, that noise may translate into the motor itself, creating some all sorts of buzzing to various noises. And it may become even more noticeable if I've got any DCC sound, so speak. So that electrical noise will actually come over. Now, a perfect example of that is the old school phones that used to be near a speaker. If you got a message, you'd get that noise at do 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 going over the speaker that's a form of interference that's actually going on and I don't want that going across my loco so these sorts of things here can be minimized depending on how you put your wiring in around the actual layout now a simple concept is on grouping certain wires together and others keeping them completely separate um, so I'll cover, I'll cover that quickly on how I'm actually going to actually do it. okay now we're going to be talking about how do we actually reduce some of that interference. Now, this is a bit of a contested debate across electrical engineers on, you know, twisting wires and stuff like that. Now, um, we're not, I'm not gonna get into that debate whatsoever. I'm gonna get into basically what is it and how do you do it and what are the benefits? And for me, in my case, I believe it's a real necessary thing um, because, uh, you know, the wiring is an electrical foundation for your actual layout and I want the foundations to be good. I want them to be proper. I want them to be strong. Um, so. How can you actually uh, reduce your interference? Well, twisting the wires. Now, that sounds a little bit interesting, but in short, it cancels that magnetic field out that we uh, showed before in my actual diagram. We've got you know, two different wires going in two different directions. The current is, we've got these magnetic fields because they're going in opposite directions, you know, they cancel themselves out. So all of a sudden we've got a reduction. Now, there are some impact, uh, factors that influence that and, you know, determine how successful that really is, such as how close your wires are. So if you've got your wires apart like this and they're twisting around as they go around the layer, how close they are will determine how effective that is. For example, being super close and tight is gonna give you a better result than having them very loosely apart. The other thing is also, is how frequent are they going to twist? So across say three feet, how many times is this uh, wire going to go around and back over here. How is it? How many twists is it going to make? So you know, over a distance. So those sorts of factors will determine how successful your twisting is. And in short, it reduces that interference. The other thing is also I'm going to be separating my buses. So the DCC bus, so my positive and negative, they'll be together and they'll be twisted around. Those two wires will be separate from my accessory bus. Again, two different wires. They'll be close together and doing twisting and the cab bus, which would be separate. So I think it's time we get into the actual bench work and show you how I plan to actually install this itself. Okay, so after all that's said and done, what sort of wiring have I actually decided and what am I using on this large layout? So here's a bit of a detail on what I'm actually using. So with my DCC bus, I've selected uh, 12AWG, as I mentioned before, that's the American wire gauge and that's a standard unit of measure of the actual wire. Now, uh, just for those that are interested, it is about 2.6 millimeters in diameter um, and it's 32 multi-strand. And if you don't know what a multi-strand wire is, um, single core wire means you've got one solid piece of wire that comes right through to conduct your electricity um, in the actual wire. If it's multi-strand, you've got many little fibers, if you want to call it that, very small strands of um, multi-strand wire and what that does is it's all woven together to produce your wire itself inside so if we cut my wire in half we would see 32 individual strands now um, each one of these strands this is about 0.2 of a millimeter i think by memory um, so incredibly thin incredibly small um, but the idea is you've got more reliability um, if one of the wire breaks you know you've got many strands there to you know cater and compensate that um, the droppers that I'm using for my actual uh, layout, so that the connection's going from my track to my actual bus, I'm using 16 uh, AWG, which is about 1.3 millimeters in diameter. Doesn't have as many strands as the DCC bus. We're looking at 16 uh, individual wires that are woven together. And my accessory bus, I've gone with 12 AWG. Um, it is roughly two millimeters in diameter, so, uh, or uh, slightly smaller than this one here. Now you might think, I'm 12AWG, this is 12AWG. 
Why is there a difference? This is 2.05 millimeters in diameter with this one is actually 2.59 millimeters in diameter and it's because the amount of strands the, the Modi CC bus has got 32 strands whereas my accessory bus is going to have 24 so not as uh, not as many individual wires in here to make up the actual wire itself now um, I'll quickly grab my and deep my actual wires and actually show you physically how they can okay be. so here is my actual DCC bus now quite a thick line or thick wire depending on how you want to look at it now comparing that with my actual droppers you can see a very big difference in the actual size there so we've got you know uh, 32 AW uh, no sorry 12 AWG and this is 16 American wire gauge different amount of strands and again you can't really see it in here this one potentially but I'm probably no nah, we're not even going to try that but yeah, multiple strands. So these are my droppers. This is my DCC bus. And of course, the uh, the colouring for the actual wires themselves. I'll go on with the typical standard. So my DCC bus is red and black. The droppers are red and black. And my accessory bus, which is running a totally different set of volts, is going to have a different purpose. I've differentiated that, and it's going to be blue and brown. Um, so good, easy way of differentiating between the two. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I'll stop talking. Let's go move over to the lab and take a look at how, how I plan to actually put this in. Okay, welcome to the actual bench work on where the wiring will start. Now, this is just a rough idea of a concept to show you guys what I'm talking about uh, with my actual wiring itself. So here, this uh, flat black cable that you can see here is what my cab bus will be. Um, as I go and install that, I'll talk about that. It is very straightforward to set up. Um, it's just a plug-in sort of system. Now, these two middle wires here, the red and the black, that's my main bus wire, which will go from the actual booster all around the actual layout. So these two will be grouped together in the center, completely separate from this one, and they'll be twisted around to reduce interference. My accessory wiring being the blue and the brown right here. This will be at the back over to here uh, where lights and signals can connect and tap into if they need power. Um, and that'll run also in select areas of the layout. So the stations here, this wiring isn't just going to uh, run across, uh, you know, the whole entire layout because not everything's going to have lighting. Um, it's in select areas. So this wiring here will do this uh, station area and it'll be separate over here. So the idea is we've got good sizable gaps in between the wiring. You know, interference from this wire is not gonna cross over to here and vice versa. Same with the accessories to here. But the other thing is also these are gonna be twisted. Same with these, just to reduce and try and prevent any interference. Uh, particularly across this layout. So, all right, I'm going to uh, switch off. I'm going to drill my holes in through my actual bench work here so I can feed my wires through um, and get that all done and then show you how it's okay. looking. Okay, so that wiring is now in. So three lots of wiring. As we talked about, here's my blue and brown wiring essentially going right along the back. That's my, my accessory bus. Now that's not going all around the entire lot. It's just going to be in those areas where I've got stations or points of interest where there might be some lamps or, uh, you know, other lighting going on. My two uh, red and black wires, which is my main DCC bus. And this black ribbon that you can see on the side here is the um, cab bus itself, which goes from my DCC. Okay, sorry about that guys, the uh, video camera just died on me so I've had to switch to the phone. So uh, anyway, you might be able to see this a bit more better. So as mentioned, this is my DCC uh, cab bus. This is my DCC bus itself. So this will go around the main lines. And that is my accessory bus just across the back here itself. Now, for those that are interested with the actual NCE system, I'm using these types of panels. Now, this isn't in its spot where it will be permanently, mainly because I haven't put a fascia on this benchwork just yet. So at the moment, it'll just be screwed in temporary like this. So, you know, I've got this hanging down here, which, I'm, which I don't like, etc. But as time goes on and I eventually put a fascia on this, I'll cut out a nice size space for it, uh, you know, suitable where the fascia is. So then it's flush mounted and hidden. There won't be this scaggy bit uh, hanging down here. But to connect these up, now this is what we call a U. TP panel um, and uh, all it is like there's my actual bus for the DCC system itself now if we go around to the back here you can see these ports uh, one on either side here and it's a simple case of plugging this in like that 
and now it's in this panel when it's connected so the other end of this wire once connected to my actual uh, smart booster itself this panel is in alive and i can control trains through there now as we come to the end so we're at the start of the layout where essentially my trains will curl in here and go down the actual line right here this is where it all starts so the other end of my cab bus itself which is this thing here this just needs to plug into my cab bus panel here which says naturally cab bus so i'll plug that into there and then uh, you know i've got a panel that's already working these two dcc bus wires themselves i've got to connect them to my track uh, right here but of course as discussed i've just got to connect this up to my um my short circuit uh, protection which involves just attaching some wires to one end and another two sets of wires going from the end of the circuit breaker into this now i'm not going to wire that in just yet only because i've got no need to same with the actual uh, cab bus as well um, my accessory bus which as you can see is just finishing right here i'll connect that up to some power etc so then that's alive and again i'll do that in due course but that is essentially the foundations for some uh, wiring and um, as time goes on I will do more for the wiring video so when I come around to installing turnouts I'll get those in when it comes to wiring my lights etc I'll put those uh, in and do a video on those and of course when doing the actual um, droppers themselves I'll do videos on soldering and how to get those in as well um, but overall that is a big big uh, <laughs> bit of wiring but uh, the goal is let's get this area of the bench work actually uh, running so even though it won't be a complete uh, loop um, you know at least I'll have some shunting that I can do to occupy myself a little bit as well um, and see how that goes so um, yeah there we go now on a slightly different uh, item probably just to cap it off and get uh, a little excited I have been starting to make it on my boards uh, the stations themselves now as the original plan has been Masbury is going to go over the ah not Masbury Binnegar is going to go over the far side and then Masbury will be over this side now Masbury will be located along this area here of the benchwork not in the middle but what I'm actually showing you here is what will be Masbury um, and as you can see here I've got a very gentle curve now I've been very fortunate enough to get some field uh, ordnance surveys back from the 1950s and I've been measuring those with a ruler, converting the feet to metres, and then converting it down to double O scale, 1 to 76. And as you can see here, I am planning Masbury out, and it is going to be 100% to scale. The bridge, um, the only thing that will be close, but I can't get exact, will be obviously the uh, the curve or the transition. I'm doing my best to get it as, bit, uh, as it was. Um, but uh, the station will be in full length, the goods yard, everything here will be in full length. So the idea is, is if I had a black and white photo in this half and trains running in this half, you would see very little difference, in, you know, including from the actual curve itself. Now that curve, as you can see there, is marked in red and, um, you know, very big, big, big sweeping curve. The... As we can see here, this is where the actual bridge will go. Ignore these lines here, guys. I'm just trying to plot things to get things to fit better. Um, so, you know, the bridge goes across here. You've got your intersection. You go left and it goes down to what will be Masbury Station. So, you know, here's an example of where, like, the waiting room will be. Here's where the actual signal box will be. Um, you know, I haven't marked any of the platforms, but, you know, it curls around and comes into part of the goods yard so as you can see i've still got another part yet to put in here um, these boards aren't in their place where they're supposed to be it's just me using the area to mark them out um, but um, you know all i've got to do is add in the extra little bit of the goods yard area here and then we will have masbury in its true scale you know even the curve itself and if i go to the other side and I'll probably put up a, a video to show it with you guys as well. So looking at that there, you can see the, the curve that's actually going on. If I put up a black and white photo just to the left here, there may be some similarities, but, uh, you know, we've still got a long way to go, a lot of work to do. Um, but we'll wait and so see. So there we go, guys. That's the wiring or the base wiring done for the actual uh, layout in one section at the moment. As I go through and do more uh, wiring, etc., I will record, record it and share it with you guys. We'll go through uh, and show you what I'm actually doing. And bear in mind, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not an electrician. I, you know, I've got a lot of knowledge on electronics, etc. But you know, 
you do what suits you best. You do your research and, um, you know, you, you undergo electrical work at your own peril, really. Um, but otherwise, guys, I hope you've learned something. Leave your feedback and comments down below. I do read them all and I do, uh, you know, uh, respond to them all as well. And of course, if you're uh, watching this for the first time, don't forget to subscribe. I do value the subscribers. It keeps me going. And uh, hopefully it won't be too much longer and we'll have another update video. In the meantime, take care of yourselves. We will talk soon. Bye for now.